Thanks, Sergio, for that nice introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be with your, you here today. I'm going to talk about our preemptive pharmacogenomics program here in Pittsburgh, and specifically how we're leveraging a, a simple uh, demonstration project and early implementation into where we think the field is going, which is large-scale implementation projects. To understand a little bit about that, you need to understand a little bit about how the environment here is at our institution. So University of Pittsburgh and University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC, is really a unique environment to test out these new uh, innovative ways of practice, specifically because UPMC is a very large uh, integrated payer provider delivery and financing system, or IDFS, and we have a, a large number of hospitals, clinics, and providers in close partnership with the University of Pittsburgh and interestingly, a payer. We have an integrated payer, a UPMC health plan, as well as an innovation center, a, a venture wing that does entrepreneurial and business enterprise investments. So from end to end, we have an entire environment here in Pittsburgh to create this learning system, to be able to deploy innovative models of care, and importantly, to advance new uh, delivery models for precision medicine. This is really spearheaded by three main groups within our medical center, the Institute for Precision Medicine, the Clinical Translational Science Institute, and then we're one of the uh, leading recruitment centers for the All of Us program here in Pennsylvania. So precision medicine is really something that's at the forefront of our institution. And you can see here in the map that our footprint extends all the way from Western Pennsylvania and into Ohio, all the way into upstate New York, and down into uh, Northern Maryland. We have a large number of, of provider uh, and, and payers involved, uh, as I mentioned before, not only our health system uh, payer, but also other commercial payers, uh, as well as government payers. A uh, large number of patients, so f as f greater than 4 million lives, 40 hospitals, and you can see here on the slides the numbers of physicians. So when we think about a deployment, we have to think about all these groups. We have to think about how we get uh, our new interventions uh, made across our system, across multiple sites, multiple different practice models, and then be able to capture the data and make sure we're able to efficiently deploy. So to start this out was our first implementation project uh, that was launched back in 2014. And like many institutions really focused on pharmacogenomics, we started in the cardiac catheterization lab of our flagship hospital, UPMC Presbyterian Hospital. And we deployed a single gene test that was designed to help us tailor antiplatelet medication after per uh, percutaneous coronary interventions, or PCIs. So this is our press release from back in 2015 when we launched. And it was a clinical program. It was a program in which all patients that came into our health system uh, with a particular uh, diagnosis that were to receive a class of medications would receive a test automatically, and those results would be used to inform care. But the design of this is really important. This is uh, how we started. We first started thinking about, well, should this be a research or a clinical program? And in order to answer that question, we started thinking about the potential value proposition. Now, this is unique because we did it at the forefront. Uh, because we are this uh, payer provider model, we care very much about not only the clinical utility that we think we could bring, but also the economics and the return on investment. So these are not the actual calculations, but it's pretty close to what we predicted to um, adding on pharmacogenomics to our current strategy and try to see if it would impact potentially the financial modeling for our institution to decide how big and how wide of an intervention we want to start off with. Now, from there, we had to develop or make available testing. And for this particular project, we selected to develop on-site testing, specifically because we needed to have a fast turnaround. At the time at which we were thinking about deploying, we had uh, a test that was being sent off-site, and it would have been five to seven days for us to return those test results, which simply was not feasible. So we brought testing on-site. We CLIA validated a panel in our, in our CAP CLIA lab and we reduced that turnaround time to approximately 24 hours. We had to develop new clinical protocols, and for that, we leaned heavily upon new guidelines at the time that had been released 
from the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. And you can see uh, those of you who have implemented, um, this is a, the, a very similar to what you find in that particular publication, where we had recommendations to tailor antiplatelet use depending on when a patient was a, a poor metabolizer or an anemia metabolizer specifically. We had to think very creatively about the informatics. In our particular institution, we have both EPIC and Cerner, so we get to do this uh, twice in both EHR systems. Uh, so that was a significant lift in thinking about how we wanted to deploy uh, clinical decision support particularly. And then we decided very early on that we needed to make sure we had discrete results. We had results that were um, fed into our EHR systems that were um, able to trigger decision support specifically on the individual phenotypes. We would, of course, have a PDF report came along with it as well, but it was really those discrete results and the harmonization of those results that was really important for getting that um, clinical decision support enabled on top of it within the EHRs. We had an education system with test to learn to be able to train our frontline providers uh, through CE-oriented programs and point-of-care programs. And then we were most importantly able to collect the phenotype results, the actual outcomes within our registry and pull it all together within a genomics data warehouse. So this is a, a very small screenshot, but in terms of our decision support, we did have decision support that fired for intermediate metabolizers, as well as poor metabolizers who were either currently or receiving, uh, to receive uh, clopidogrel. They would recommend alternative therapy, which was prasigrel or ticagrel at our institution. And then we spun up brand new pharmacist-led services. So pharmacists at our institution um, respond to every uh, test with a brief note that helps direct care and reaches out to the provider, whether the patient's in or outside the hospital, uh, about any potential changes in prescribing. So this program's been uh, tremendously successful. You can see here that we're, um, at the time, we're at 2,900 test results. Um, and this day, we're just over 3,000. And you can see our predicted phenotype reports were very similar to what you would expect by population frequencies. Uh, approximately 28 or 29 percent of our patients altogether had a carry to loss of function variant. And we look at the medications they were prescribing, about 20 percent of them had an actionable result overall that would necessitate a change in medication management. So those are facilitated again by our pharmacist led services. Uh, our consult notes and working through regular uh, traditional changes and recommendations once those test results came back. So fast forward a number of years and we were very fortunate to partner with seven other institutions within the NIH's implementation network called IGNITE. And this is a, a publication many of you may have seen already that was a pragmatic clinical trial that combined the outcomes for major adverse cardiac events among these seven institutions. And this Kaplan-Meier chart shows that uh, patients that were loss of function carriers that were that had remained on clopidogrel for whatever reason had a statistically significant difference of um, the composite for, med for MACE, for death, MI, and stroke, that was higher than patients that were converted to an alternative. And there was no difference between the gray line, the non-loss of function carrier, and those were switched. So this is exactly what you want to see in a precision medicine project, a pharmacogenomics project, that shows if we're able to tailor prescribing, we can get to an outcome that's no different from a patient that may not be carrying this loss of function variant. So we're really excited by this. And this network has gone on and, and work that was led by uh, Nita Limdi at UAB to be able to do the ac economic modeling. So I urge you to read this paper that just came out last year or earlier this year. Uh, that describes the economic and the cost modeling downstream of this uh, with a sensitivity analysis that goes through different costs of testing as well as different deployment models to recommend uh, that a genotype guided strategy may be superior to conventional approaches. So this was a very successful deployment in our institution. Our institution was excited about the opportunities for sort of spearheading our genomic programs specifically through pharmacogenomics and out to our other uh, hospitals and other clinics. Now, at this time, we were also very aware of that there were many other gene drug pairs that we were excited about deploying, but sort of had to think through, well, do we want to do this again and again with individual gene drug pairs? So this is a common thought that I think many institutions 
and, and practice sites in the field they're dealing with, is whether to run individual single gene tests and implement them that way as gene drug pairs, or think more broadly about whether we should be considering panel-based testing. So our institution and our research group started doing analyses to determine whether it made sense to jump to a preemptive model we would get results well in advance of needing them. And then for many genes that may have gene drug associated uh, recommendations and guidelines, in order to be much more strategic about taking care of all of our patients that were in our practice model and within the UPMC system. So we started looking at our data from our existing project first and said, well, if we got these CYP2C19 data results back, were they useful to be reused? And we always talk about germline results, which 2C19 is a germline test, of course, uh, being potentially reusable, not only for the same medication again, but also for any other medication that might be going through a similar pathway. So we conducted the analysis on the left that shows that um, there were many patients that had gone on to receive in just a six month period, another medication that went through the same pathway and would have a interruptive clinical decision support alert that recommend a change in therapy. Now these were often proton pump inhibitors or antidepressants um, that would recommend an alternative path if we had these genetic tests on file, meaning that the result was not only useful for the original indication, but also for subsequent tests and subsequent drug prescribing. If we could just make sure that test result was available to the downstream provider. Now the same, uh, same, same type of analysis was just done on a broader scale. You can see the N being much larger within the uh, Ignite Pharmacogenomics Working Group. And this was a study led by Amber Betelschies at Maryland that was also recently published that shows similar data in that about half of the patients uh, received a subsequent CYP2C19 substrate or a medication that went through the same pathway. And then a, a large proportion of those actually had a gene drug interaction where they had a phenotype that suggests that an intervention would need to be made based on that predicted phenotype and test result. Again, emphasizing that these results are likely to be reusable even with a single gene test. Now, as we think more broadly, uh, we conducted an analysis of much larger data sets. In the first uh, graph at the top there, the table shows our data from a publication uh, several years back. We looked at 73 million patients and looked at the incident use of drugs that have pharmacogenomic guidance, and it was extremely high. Right around the same 50% suggests that patients that were in these age groups listed had a very high frequency of being prescribed these medications in uh, a general uh, payer landscape. Again, this is sort of uh, CMS data predominantly to be able to um, show that, that these, these results would be usable if we had pharmacogenomic tests on file. And then recently, a new study by uh, Sony Tutasia's group at Penn um, and others uh, pulled together results looking at um, a similar analysis in a veteran population and showed that 99% carried at least one actionable variant and that there was a high incidence of CPIC-A drugs being prescribed in a six-year period. Again, emphasizing there is likely utility in a U.S. veteran population for having these data on file in a large number of patients and that potentially it could be used in a relatively short time horizon. This is six years, uh, but you can imagine in the VA system where patients are seen continuously for, for quite some time that these data would have increasing value as patients came back into the health system and were prescribed new medications. So in, in, our, in our analysis, thinking back at our own health system, seeing this type of data made us think, well, do we want to do individual gene drug deployments or do we want to think more broadly? And the solution was definitely the latter. So we, we formed a new partnership and a really innovative uh, academia health system industry partnership. You can see the groups described here and in our publication that emphasized um, the direction and the goals of this. We created a brand new pharmacogenomic center of excellence in Pittsburgh by bringing together uh, my group here in, in Pitt Pharmacy and the School of Pharmacy at the University of Pittsburgh, CTSI that I mentioned before, this research-based framework um, that provides infrastructure across the university, the uh, Institute for Precision Medicine, leading precision medicine programs, as well as UPMC Clinical, our brand new genome center, the health plan, as well as that commercialization unit within UPMC. 
And in partnership with Thermo Fisher, which was a, a, certainly a leading um, innovator in developing testing solutions, we brought this new center of excellence to Pittsburgh with the goal of doing preemptive panel-based testing in at least 150,000 patients and to be able to return these results to researchers and clinicians. So this is that model. A patient would come in, um, or in this case, actually, um, they wouldn't be a patient, they would be a, a research uh, participant. So in this case, an individual is interested in our study. Um, they are recruited to join an institution of biorepository, and the results uh, from a pharmacogenomic panel uh, that is run in a brand uh, new CAP-CLIA lab, and it's all clinically validated within our genome center. And the results end up being returned to a clinical, I mean, sorry, to a, a research pipeline um, as VCF, so a, a common um, a genetic data format, a variant call file, where we would merge that data with pharmacogenomic test results, EHR data, and claims data to understand the relationships between genotypes and phenotypes, conduct new analytics, and to do more novel-based drug response phenotyping and understanding all the downstream economic value. To develop these economic proof points we think are essential to advance the field moving forward. Now, this panel is broad. Um, it covers a, a, approximately 1,200 genes, um, but we were not ready to return all of those to clinical care. After all, not all the results um, have clinical guidelines um, yet. And because of that, we selected and curated the ones that we thought were ready for clinical deployment and actionability within a clinical environment. So within our clinical pipeline, we brought forward 14 genes and developed a pipeline, a clinical pipeline, to be able to do allele translation, phenotype assignment, be able to report discrete results, again, to Epic and Cerner, have a CLIA-based sign out, and then return those results to UPMC EHRs, services, and to patients directly through their MyUPMC patient portal. Now, again, this is all done in the CAP-CLIA lab, um, so essentially a traditional regular clinical sign-off process, and it's elective, meaning a patient that signs the research consent um, is interested in being an individual uh, involved in research, uh, would elect for return, um, and these individuals would get the results back through regular clinical services. They would also contribute to research um, by contributing their data into this research pipeline. So the overall hypothesis is an a priori prediction of patient drug report, uh, response phenotypes through pharmacogenomic uh, specifically will drive research engagement, like get people excited about participating in research in our institution uh, biorepository, that it will drive cost-effective improvements in medication outcomes. Again, these economic proof points we're all look, looking for in terms of pre proving clinical utility. And then finally, new genotype phenotype discovery, because we will look for potentially rare variants in a very large population and link it to medication outcomes as we have all the prescribing data for these patients. Uh, this is a photo from our genome center. And again, this uh, new panel that we're deploying is PharmacoScan, uh, a product of Thermo Fisher Scientific. It's about 1,200 genes, 4,600 variants, and important includes a copy number um, variant assessment for uh, CYP2D6, as well as other genes on the research side. Those all end up going into research, and then the 14 genes I mentioned are uh, what will be returned uh, when that pathway is elected by these individuals going through this research project. On the clinical side, these discrete results flow into the electronic health record, again, when elected, and patients receive the results through their patient portal. And on the provider side, we're doing a lot with education to make sure that Providers know how to use this data. Uh, we know our pharmacists are, many of them are well-trained and understand how to use pharmacogenomic information, but we have a lot of providers across our health system, um, and we really need to raise the bar and, and extend education out to the providers that may not be as knowledgeable about deploying these results in order to capture that return on investment. So this means uh, triggered interruptive alerts where necessary, uh, access to education wherever that needs to be at the point of care, and then when necessary, um, provide services. So that's pharmacist-led services and directing patients into our new primary care precision medicine clinic. That's a partnership between pharmacy, family medicine, and genetic counselors to be able to provide in-person or maybe telemedicine nowadays uh, care directly to these patients. 
And I want to spend a little bit of time talking specifically about the education piece as I finish up. This education is really, really important. Again, we have thousands of providers that may not feel comfortable in the surveys that have been published across many institutions so that, that it, the providers are really eager to provide these services, but don't have quite the confidence to be able to do this. So we have an innovative education program that's called Test to Learn that allows providers to work with real genetic data uh, in order to learn how to provide these services and take care of the patients using these new test results. So the unique part of this uh, training is that uh, learners can go through personal genomic testing. So they can go through the same testing that their future uh, patients will or individuals that are participating in this research will, and they'll be able to look at the results. And we have um, a strong outcome data that showed both objectively and subjectively that um, performance goes up. And this, in our early study, was in a PharmD uh, curriculum in a school of pharmacy. But we see uh, great data surrounding efficacy and confidence of, of providers using these data as well. And this program um, has been so successful that we deployed it in many other universities and health systems across the country uh, through generous support of the folks that you see uh, below at the bottom of the screen. So after education, the, the real engine for return uh, on the return of investment on the discovery side of things is to uh, estimate the return on investment, just like we did with the clopidogrel and the cath lab, to identify populations and draw circles around them and be able to track them moving forward, take that phenotype, uh, look for the outcomes within their claims data and their outcome data within EHRs or necessary additional data collection, and then pilot to measure those outcomes with the therapy changes and validate the model and then just turn the, that, that circle around to develop economic proof points. On the research side, where we think the data are not quite ready, this is how we generate more data. Uh, we collect the genotypes, measure the phenotypes, and then to see whether there seems to be an association that could potentially move forward into our clinical modeling. So this is our, our engine for using um, and, and demonstrating clinical utility. Finally, in looking at those first few patients that are involved in this new Pharmacogenomic Center of Excellence project, we recruited just over 5,000 patients to date. And again, we did the same analysis to determine whether you're taking medications and to know whether the decision support we've already written uh, for these uh, gene drugs would fire on these patients as we return results. And indeed, that same percentage is there again. About 40% of our patients uh, are taking our one drug, uh, at least where there is some uh, alert that would fire immediately. And you can see the decreasing percentages, but still fairly large numbers that have been exposed to many drugs. And you can see the numbers are very, very high there, where there's a subset of population that are on five or more medications um, that would potentially have an even more value from this. So I'll close there with thanking our entire team um, to build a uh, infrastructure in a uh, preemptive program and even the demonstration project I mentioned before, it takes a large group of folks uh, with a variety of expertise, certainly a multidisciplinary team from everything from pharmacogenomics and pharmacy uh, to the areas we're deploying and all the different institutes and groups I've talked about. Uh, so I want to thank them and I want to thank you uh, for your attendance today and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.